We are live. Here we are. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the WebDM live show. I'm Jim Davis, and uh, we are here today hanging out, answering questions, and uh, working through this Imperial City uh, mega dungeon that uh, I'm sort of designing in my spare time just as a have something to do, exercise my creativity. Uh, I find that whenever I'm working on a creative project, having something else that's different, but still creative on the side that I can turn to, to sort of uh, replenish my creative energies is a uh, interesting and fun way to spend my time. So that's what we're working on today, hanging out and uh, the like. It's been a while. Hope you all enjoyed the uh, uh, last week's video. And let me see. Before we get started, uh, we're going to be uh, diving in today to this uh, layer of Grimble the Patient, this cannibal god of the dwarves. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to talk about our sponsor, MCG's newest Kickstarter that's going on right now, uh, Old Gods of Appalachia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And like, this is one of those settings that I that really <laughs> hits a lot of my uh, sweet spots. It's it, it's set against this backdrop of an alternative Appalachia of the 1920s and 30s, and the PCs are there trying to investigate these unknowable or, or uncomprehensible events connected to the mountains themselves. They're trying to protect what's important to them uh, as these dangers uh, are things that the modern industrial world is not yet ready to uh, <laughs> ready to handle. So the Appalachian Mountains are amongst the oldest in the world. Uh, eons ago, they were made into a prison for this inner darkness and like time has ground down these mountains and the prison walls have worn thin. So industrialization came along and it sort of further has weakened the walls of these prisons, exposing the cracks and the influence of the inner dark has slipped through. And because the small community towns around here are basically owned by the mining and rail companies, some of which even have the inner dark influencing them as well, like the power over these small towns is immense. And these small towns are also facing uh, creatures from the green, which aren't necessarily evil, but more predatory. Uh, as the encroachment into the mountains uh, further riles up these supernatural beings. Uh, so this is an ongoing Kickstarter campaign uh, launched uh, yesterday. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's for a standalone RPG. It's got everything you need to play, character generation, complete rules, adventures, creatures, items, all that kind of stuff. You can delve into this alternate setting. Uh, there's a couple of tons of lore uh, within the books and everything. There's a free preview with complete rules and sample characters, creatures, ciphers, the whole shebang on the uh, Kickstarter page. So uh, if you back it within the first 48 hours, you get a free Barrow and Lock script coin with your rewards. Uh, that's uh, one of those like company town money uh, script coins uh, that you get to use for uh, for your games. So yeah, check it out. There's a bunch of really cool gaming stuff uh, that's part of the Kickstarter. Uh, we'll have a link in the description and the chat. So check it out, Old Gods of Appalachia from our sponsors, uh, MCG. Awesome, there we go. So yeah, we'll take a little drink here. I'll show you guys the big mug. This is it. There we go. Just uh, proof that it exists. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I hope everybody has had a great last couple of weeks. Uh, I know I have. We are <laughs> almost uh, finished with uh, our book. I know we say that quite a bit, but guess what? Each time we say it, it's more true than it was the last time. Uh, so progress has been made. <laughs> We're working on like the last chapter plus edits and things like that. And so hopefully it'll be done really soon. It, the, the, the more it comes together, uh, the more excited I am for you guys out there to check it out. So uh, keep your eye on our various social media for updates on that. Um, but enough about all that. Uh, we're here to hang out. We're here to talk about dungeons and the various dragons and monsters uh, that you'll find within them. And um, this one, uh, which I'll show you guys here in a second, assuming I am able to share my screen, uh, <laughs> is it, it is a part of a, a mega dungeon that I've worked on off and on for I don't know two or three years now. Uh, set beneath the imperial capital of this magical empire. 
and the ideas that this city is built around a, a nexus of ley lines that is ever shifting, right? So that they can't build a, a tower in a certain nexus and expect that it will always be at that nexus of magical power. Sometimes that tower might need to move as these currents shift and change over you know, centuries and millennia. And so the city itself has left behind this trail of ruined urban scape as the various ley lines have shifted and where where's the hot spot in the city uh, now and and it's sort of built on this mound of layers of urban <laughs> uh, ruinscape that serve as cellars temples sewers all kinds of things that individuals might still hold as important even though they were you know leveled to the ground and built over centuries ago you know followers of a particular god might find one of those buried temples still relevant, still sacred. Um, you know, there might be ancestral crypts or vaults for, for some of the residents of the city that are still down there. And so it creates an environment where, <clears throat> much like Yawning Portal and the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, town sits right above the adventure area. And so there is no, um, you know, no lag time between adventure hook accepted and at the doorstep of adventure, as opposed to the standard model of hook accepted wilderness journey of indeterminate length at the adventure site. Uh, this is, you know, that cuts out the middleman and gets the characters right into the dungeon. But it also means that parts of the dungeon are civilized. Parts of the dungeon are extensions of the town. And so the first level uh, is, of these dungeons aren't always, um, you know, just meat grinders or, or, you know, slaughter fests. It's sewer jacks and rat catchers going about their job. It's, you know, secret cults on their way to and from places further deeper into the underworld. Um, so we're looking at a, um, let me see. <clears throat> I'll share this with you guys now. Dun, dun, dun. So we're basically looking at a, well, I'm looking at it. You guys aren't yet. <laughs> and uh, here, okay, here we go. All right. So yes, paint is my preferred DM prep tool of choice for things like this because it is simple and easy to use. And I know that there are many other <laughs> image altering programs and the like that uh, you could have, but I found mine years ago and here, here it is. It's paint. <laughs> so this is what it looks like kind of zoomed out uh, overall. So you get a real good picture of what the finished complete map is. Uh, every one of the 152 or 153 entries has something for it. Even if it's just a word or two that tells me what kind of room it is or something. Um, triangles are rooms that have some sort of treasure in them. It's outlined in black. It's probably hidden somewhere. Uh, if it's outlined in red, it is trapped uh, as well as hidden. Um, same with doors, solid black, it's locked, barred, maybe both. Outlined in red, it's trapped as well. Um, so that just gives me a visual key of the dungeon as a whole. I can see where the various subregions are, lime green, sort of a pale purple. Tan is the <laughs> occluded temple of Grimble the patient, this uh, cannibal cult, uh, sort of olive green down here is more of a, a reptile infiltrators so like basically chameleon ninjas uh, that are uh, in the city thanks to a <laughs> a spell that was inspired by another uh, mcg uh, monica Cook games product uh, invisible sun um, and then over here in the sort of grayish blue is a uh, the archives of the imperial bureaucracy where the mummy scribes continue to go about their business uh, despite the uh, efforts of time to stop them from their civil service. So this is what it looks like at a whole. I use symbols, colors, putting the enemies directly on the map as just like a quick uh, little you know reminder to myself to be able to have a complete picture of the dungeon at once. This, this dungeon right here might take two to three years to finish playing through. Right. Uh, this is why I don't put too much work or effort into any one individual entry, because I could get a lot of gaming out of just what I have so far. Um, and so today, what I kind of want to do is 
walk through the shortest route between the most likely entrance the PCs would have to the Veiled Temple itself to kind of give you a tour of the Mega Dungeon and along the way show you how I arrived at stocking the dungeon the way I did. I know we had some questions about uh, the method I was using and the tables that I was using. And uh, as usual, the default answer is they're written in a journal of mine somewhere, uh, you know, handwritten and uh, not readily accessible. But today uh, I have that. <laughs> so uh, we'll share that later. <clears throat> Let's see. So just a sec. Let's see. As usual, uh, we'll, I we will uh, answer questions sort of intermittently as uh, as I walk through this, but um, I want to get into it because to me, I I have something that I think is a complete dungeon. I could run this in classic D and D zero edition, <laughs> uh, my preferred of all the classic editions, or I could run it in fifth edition. Um, that's one of the reasons I use original D&D &D as a prep tool for things like this, because it is scalable to any version of D&D &D or any of its, you know, ripoffs, knockoffs, retro clones, whatever uh, you want to call them, uh, you know, adventure game. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, uni it's, it presents sort of a, a universal prep method that I've found is really useful. Um, and it relies on basically me going through several iterations of keying the dungeon first randomly and then developing those random elements so that they make sense, they connect with each other, seeing what patterns emerge, and then building potential narratives, a setup of a narrative uh, that when the PCs encounter it, that's when it kicks into action. And so in essence, all of the rooms that have uh, labels on them, the creatures in them, are little mini scenes waiting to unfold. Might be a battle, might be a negotiation, might be an exchange of information, might be new allies, might be a bitter grudge. We don't know. We're playing to find out. Um, so we're exploring both the physical layout of the dungeon when we play, as well as the social layout of the dungeon, of the various encounters. Excuse me. There you go. I had to turn my mic off for that one. All right. So this first room over here is the entrance to what I called the Pauper's Crypt. And this is a, or was meant to be a public burial place funded by some imperial dynast who had, you know, wanted to get in good with the populace, with the demos, and, uh, you know, was going to fund a crypt, a catacomb for people who otherwise couldn't afford proper burial. Of course, you want to afford proper burial because otherwise you'll end up as some sort of a grotesque undead. And this was their effort to do that. It is sadly unfinished. And the first five rooms of this dungeon are here to tell a story about the decay of the imperial capital of this first room, which has all these statues in it. And that's where these stars are over here. I'll zoom in a little closer for you guys here at number one. Uh, these are various saints and patrons who had funded this particular crypt. This is dedicated to them. If there's any clerics in the party, chances are they worship or revere at least one of these saints. And everyone who resides in the imperial capital knows who the imperial family is. Um, but as you progress into room two, where some of the first uh, people who were interred are, they're sort of wrapped in linens in canvas bags with herbs to keep away the vermin. And they're reverentially in, uh, interred within there. No one's messed with them, but the walls are covered in graffiti. There's trash everywhere from the street. And then by the time you get into three and all of the various shelves, which would otherwise hold the bodies, they are stuffed to the brim. No one has cared how they're taken care of. Many of them are just dumped somewhere. And number three, number four, number five, uh, these rooms have become essentially the dumping ground for criminals uh, where they you know, dump their dead bodies. Um, you'll see that there's two <laughs> yellow triangles here, which means the party can go diving in decaying bodies for treasure if they wish, and a giant carnivorous toad, which is feasting on the cadavers and presents our first combat challenge. This would be a, a creature that is bestial. It's not going to do anything, uh, you know, tricky or anything like that. It's going to try to eat 
the first character it can get in its mouth and it's currently eating and so it might not hear the party sneak up on them i'd give them a bonus to surprise if i was running it in classic D D, or really you know you know have disadvantage on the toad's passive perception at 5e and this gives the party a chance to beat up on a big dumb monster and it's gross it's obviously something that needs to to stop and it's also a monster that i ended up rolling something like four or five times for this one so there's lots of carnivorous toads that infest this section of the underworld um <clears throat> and number five is this bone strewn lair where you can go and check it out uh, <laughs> you know for uh, for some more tr uh, treasure in the form of loose change um but by number six the construction on the crypt has stopped and I would pretty much describe this as a dungeon highway. There are areas of a dungeon where, and I'll zoom out again, you can sort of see, where it's pretty clear that this is a connecting point between uh, locations that are otherwise sort of sequestered away from each other or in their own little corners. And that's where the various factions of the dungeon are. And so number six, number seven, uh, 10, 11, all of these are rooms where there's just empty. There might be a random encounter here if it comes up on the dice, um, but they're really here for players to gather information about what else is in the dungeon, looking for tracks, traces, clues, that sort of thing. Uh, empty rooms like like a lot of these, <laughs> pretty much anyone that doesn't have a, a blue text in it, are there not as like a blank space as in boring, but they're there as a different kind of scene. Whereas a creature, an encounter with a, a wandering monster or creature in any kind of dungeon is a scene of some sort of interaction, whether it's violent or nonviolent, right? And empty rooms are scenes of puzzles, information gathering, you know, picking up on clues, that sort of thing. A chance for the players to do something to alter the dungeon, right? To bury a stash of treasure or leave, leave behind a supply uh, cache in case they need it later that sort of thing. Uh, so that's uh, the, one of the benefits of an empty room. <clears throat> so let's see. Because right now we're at number six. Party could easily get here, you know, within the first hour or so, definitely, uh, of play, uh, probably much sooner than that. And they have a choice. They could come down here and mess around with the goblins who are supposed to be here. These are the professional uh, sewer jacks and rat catchers of the goblins a uh, union of public servants or public surveyors and engineers. And, you know, they can fight the goblins if they want. They can not fight the goblins if they want. There are, is no law in the underworld, uh, despite the relations that people may have uh, topside. Um, but for now, I'd like to skip that because heading from six to 28, uh, that takes us into the lair of the underworld tiger, which is a ghost eating saber tooth tiger that's in grayscale. And, uh, um, it is attracted by this murderous specter in 99 and it would also be more than a match for a party of first level uh, characters, first or second level characters. Um, in classic D&D, &D, this is a five plus one hit die monster. And that's, that's not as a serious monster. <laughs> you would not want to have to fight that uh, as a, as, even with you know a bunch of henchmen as a first level party. Um, but there's other people in the dungeon who can tell you about the tiger you can feed it something and run by um, you know while it's eating you, you can luck out and it's not there when you try to sneak in that sort of thing but it's drawn by the murderous specter in 99 so you'd pass through these uh rooms uh, the the earth around here everything that's hash marked is a, a substrate of packed earth debris and masonry rubble uh, because this is again cities that has been leveled filled in and uh, re, you know, built on top of and shifted around um, numerous times over the millennium. Um, so benefit of that is also that these rooms can be anything. At any point, you can say the, the architecture changed. It's a different house, a different building. It's a part of an unfinished basement. So it, it gives you a lot of freedom uh, in thematically arranging your dungeon, whichever way you want. Uh, it's another pro for the dungeon under the city <laughs> uh, method of, of uh, design. Um, but the underworld tiger is drawn here by this murderous specter, which is in 99. And that gets us to the temple itself. Uh, and I'd like to take a quick break from checking out the dungeon to answer some questions 
uh, because uh, I think the, t- the temple is really disturbing. <laughs> Uh, I have some and, questions for you, Jim Davis. Yeah, let's uh, let's answer. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Uh, I can see my beautiful face. Your beautiful face. <laughs> hey, everybody. This yeah, is hit me with some Emma. questions. Yes. This yeah, is I'm gonna, taking your questions. Uh, I'm gonna start from the top. Of uh, Friedrich wants to know: Do you ever use the dungeon tools from Worlds Without Number? Mm, yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, World, Worlds Without Number is um, it's. It's, it's it's one of the books that sits by my by my desk. It's it's quite uh, quite useful. Uh, that along with the uh, fifth edition tables, there's there's a lot of really good t- uh, world building and dungeon building tables in the five E DMG. There's just not an index for them, uh, which which is the uh, problem in just sort of finding them. But they are tucked away in nearly every chapter. Useful tables for building dungeons, traps, tricks all kinds of things. Um, but Worlds Without Number is, is definitely one of my go-tos. Um, another one is the Dungeon Alphabet from Goodman Games. Um, let me see if I can find it. I don't know how, I don't know if this is still in print or not, but this is an A, B, C, you know, A through Z for like A is for altar, D is for door. And it's just a random table of interesting things to do with these mundane dungeon elements, altars, mirrors, pools, fungus, things you normally don't think about uh, can be made adventuresome and interesting uh, with Dungeon Alphabet. So those are my go-tos, uh, those three. Sweet. All right, next up, we have Jaskal. We're not answering your question. Um, it's okay, no. Uh, Grant Train, <laughs> what are some repeatable features that the PCs interact with that we can include in a, include in a dungeon? So, like what things can you keep? Yeah, well, if, if you're using the same dungeon over and over again, which if you're going to go through this much work to make a dungeon that has 153 keyed entries, run it more than once. So certain rooms can be beneficial. Uh, for this one, uh, there's a room that we didn't go to uh, that splits off north from the first room uh, that has what I call the Chthonic Orrery, a, a, a planar observatory for the underworld. And the PCs could visit it to see whether or not their foray into the underworld is auspicious or not. And if it is, they'll get clues as to their first encounters. I'll just roll up the first D6 encounters that they'll have, and I'll just roll them up right then, and that will they'll know what they're going to face the first six times, D6 times. Or if they're going after a particular boss or looking for something particular, maybe they'll get a clue if it's a favorable omen. If it's not a favorable omen, then it's like, no, you're, you're, you won't find it today unless like, luck is really on your side um so that, that is, that's one thing that, that'd be a um you know a feature that's unlocked by befriending the priest that tends to the planar observatory that uh, could take a reading for the party and it's not something that's just available to them but other things are uh, apart from things you could put in rooms are the wandering encounter tables so you can reflect the party's impact on you know particular dungeon denizen population by removing them or adding more of them to an encounter table you know if excuse me goodness ate lunch right before this my bad um (laughs) so let's say that the you know the pcs have been teaming up with the kobolds to fight the gnolls or whatever in the dungeon and the gnolls have been hit hard in several you know big battles and so you stop putting gnolls on the random encounter table because they don't have the strength to patrol anymore they just have the strength to defend what little territory in the dungeon they have left so that's another way you can show the impact of the party's actions um but secret doors changes to the dungeon right just completely erasing you know you know a quarter of it and redrawing it so the next time they visit it and they turn they're like wait a minute why is this different you don't need to justify it it's a mythic underworld it's a supernatural underworld uh, you can it is it makes as much naturalistic or logical sense as you want it to, and sometimes having something just happen just because helps reinforce the fact that it's a dangerous supernatural underworld. Hope that helps. Sweet. Yeah. Do you want an on-topic question or an off-topic question? You know what? I'm good for either. Let's do an off-topic question just okay. as a wild card. Okay, because I was rude to Jaskal and told him I wasn't going to answer one I'm question. Sorry. <laughs> It's cool. I, I, I know this person. I don't know how you are. We're cool. Yes. Another question. 
yeah. going to answer it, which is, what are your thoughts on Watsy's purchase of D&D Beyond? It's a long time coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I use D&D Beyond all the time. I, I can't imagine playing 5th edition without it. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in that, uh, you know, we got sort of sponsored by D&D Beyond for a while and got the the big legendary you get everything package um, as part of being a YouTube influencer. And so I use it all the time. I, I make good use of it. And if I lost it today, I would be I would seriously consider just buying it because it is that useful. Um, and so I think it's it's a long time coming. If you if you browse the forums of D&D Beyond at all, you'll see that a lot of the users of D&D Beyond assume it's owned by D&D anyway. There's a lot of people on, I mean, not just the D&D Beyond forums, but just like across the internet who are like, D&D Beyond isn't already owned by D&D. So it makes sense in that, in that sense. And uh, yeah, I've, I've liked D&D Beyond since I started using it. I think it's, it's great. <laughs> it's a really great tool. And um, I hope it leads to uh, something, you know, even better. Uh, so I'm glad for it. It's cool. That was an off topic. Sweet. It's still D&D. Well, it's D&D. It's yeah, not. Yeah. It's not. Hey, anything. if it means they bring back UA stuff for D to make your characters with, then I'm all for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Let's do one more question then. Yeah. And get back to things. Yep. Uh, Goblinite. How do you change the dynamic of your dungeon when you see your parties running out of health and options? Do you strategically place puzzles or other encounters? This is I, I try to. <laughs> yeah. You know, I and so for the keyed locations you see here that have blue text in it, that is that is sort of a situation in stasis, but it doesn't happen when the PCs open the door because that just leads to um flavorless dungeoneering let's call it it's a reactive living place and so if the monster in room seven or whatever you know hears is next to room six and and hears that something's going on then that monster reacts in an appropriate way and you can either role play that out uh, which involves to me too many decisions so i defer some of that to uh, or what i call oracle dice these are dice that I rely on as a GM to tell me what my NPCs or world does uh, when I'm afraid or worried or just don't want to have to come up with something or I'm stuck in a rut, uh, whatever. Um, so that is, um, that's what I think I might've forgotten the question, uh, which happens sometimes, especially uh, in the middle of the day. So I don't know if I, <laughs> what is oh, Emma? Can, uh, can I get an yeah. assist? Uh, and assist with well, I've I've been social mediaing oh, and I not no, listening. To I you. got off. I got <laughs> I I do I do what I do, and I answered a question, and then I forgot the the question as I was answering it. So I'm not. Uh, the question just, is: uh, Do you do you change stuff around in your party? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Change it all. Yeah, change it between every visit. Um, you know, if they cleared out a bunch of rooms, what? How long do they stay empty before something else moves in? You, yeah, you have to keep it dynamic, uh, and, and you're, if you're gonna use a dungeon as your default, what you're doing that session kind of play. Otherwise it gets stale and boring. Um, and I, I think the trouble you might run into with fifth edition is it just takes a while to resolve combat <laughs> in fifth edition compared to uh, earlier editions of D and D where this play style was more common of just exploring a big dungeon because you can get through a combat in 10, 15 minutes, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> both because the numbers are lower, less hit points, but just, it, it flows faster um so yeah but fifth edition is possible to play it that way too you know uh, you know so it's it's a um, it's a matter of what the players are into if they want to take their time with combat if they want big tactical battles this style might not be uh, as great and so you might not get as much need for repeat use right you might just visit this place once and then you're done because that's just the way you're playing excuse me but um, yeah, I hope that answers the, uh, the question. Ready to dive back in? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Here we are back in the dungeon. So we're going to dive into it. And someone uh, this week asked about the tables that I was using 
to stock the dungeon. And um, we will share those. I don't know where how we'll, we'll get. We'll share this. Probably share those through our Patreon. Um, but I have I threw up a simple little um, matrix of it, typed up the uh, handwritten notes that I was using. And essentially, what it is is a roll to see which table I'm going to roll on for the monster. And the tables are broken down by what level that dungeon or what level of the dungeon that monster would normally be found on. So first level dungeon monsters are things like brain rats little slimes and oozes or decrepit skeletons things like that things that a first level party of adventurers can overcome without too much worry that one of them is going to go down and but you don't want just that and so there's a chance on the first level that you get monsters that are first level dungeon monsters second level dungeon monsters third level dungeon monsters and then it, the matrix just sort of s- spreads that out so that you're never getting all of the same kind of monster. It varies up the difficulty of them. So it means that you get things like the Underworld Tiger here in 28, <laughs> that's a, uh, in classic D&D is five plus one hit die, which is uh, you know, the sum of five dice plus one. Uh, and that's that's nothing to sneeze at. That is a terrifying monster for a first level party. Um, but it also, you, they could go the other way and it's half hit die brain rats and an orphaned familiar. So, <laughs> you know, it's one or the other. It's uh, keeping it interesting and, and varied is why I use the random methods uh, that I use. And that's also why I use uh, classic D&D as a base so that I can add the complexity as I want. <clears throat> so everything in Tan is the veiled temple of Grimble the Patient. Grimble is a chaos demon uh, reviled by the dwarves, an ancestral foe, an ancient evil, of theirs. Uh, Grimble loves nothing more than to feast upon the honored dead of the dwarvish clans and delights in turning dwarves into bitter, greedy, cantankerous, just jerks. <laughs> just re- really delights in making dwarves be their worst selves. And so Grimble uh, does things like gift, uh, you know, outcast dwarves, you know, knowledge of alchemy, poisons, diseases, curses, the things that they might need to get revenge uh, on the people that uh, outcast them, that sort of thing. Gribble is served by two demons, the Auroch of Baal, which is a bronze bull gargoyle thing, and uh, Gothmog, which is another sort of, sorry, Gothrog. Gothmog is the commander of the armies and uh, Return of the King. Uh, Gothrog, totally different, is a, another sort of grotesque bullish cannibal demon thing and so most of the temple is dedicated towards honoring one of those three entities or mocking the clan that this cult has taken over these are the ancestral clan holds of the smithstonian clan that's with an extra t and (laughs) the smithstonians are an influential dwarven family in imperial capital and then fallen on hard times and their current patriarch uh, has taken up worship of Grimball in a in vain and foolish attempt to r- restore the clan's fortunes and now has lost control of the cult to the various cannibal ghouls, butcher ogres, and terrifying uh, gr- grotesque dwarven abominations that inhabit this place. There's two ways to get to it. The entrance in 78, which is open, anybody can walk in or this dugout stairway over in 99, which is I think where we're gonna start because it's the quickest route. And it takes you through two really nasty fights, one with the underworld tiger through the various dugouts of 100 into the crypt of the clan lords uh, in 99, where the collective angry spirits of all of the desecrated graves of the uh, desecrated remains uh, from these graves have come together and manifested as a rather nasty specter. Um, this is one of the oddities of using classic D&D, original Dungeons and Dragons for uh, as a base because in original D&D, a specter is a terrifying monster that is just below a vampire in terms of its lethality. And in fifth edition, it's a CR1, you know, your, your first level incorporeal undead. Uh, so specter here should be taken in its classical sense. It probably use a wraith, a super, like a max hit point uh, wraith, uh, if I were using this in fifth edition. 
So this is a nasty monster, but because it's the angry, um, you know, manifestation of the angry, uh, you know, ancestors of these dwarves, it can be placated. It can be talked to, it can be bargained with. Uh, if the party has a dwarf in, you know, with them, if the party has someone with religion or something, this is a chance for me to prompt them that this, it, you, you recognize this for what it is, right? You, you don't have to fight this, but it wants to kill you because it's angry. And, and so, you know, or you could trick the underworld tiger into eating it. You know, you could get rid of it that way too. Uh, <laughs> coming up and through here, uh, we have basically these are old vaults and cellars and the like of the Smithsonian estate, which was once vast. Uh, they, they're incredibly influential in the imperial court and the like, fallen on hard times. And so many of these corridors are now, uh, you know, dusty, cobweb strewn, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and so here in 98, we've got like a little place the party could sneak in if they wanted to. It connects to this uh, sewer vent or sewer channel here. They wanted to crawl through here. I would make this just really nasty and gross. It's, pretty, it's, it's a tight squeeze to get in uh, for medium characters and you know large characters don't even think about it. Small could go in, but then they'd be up to their chin in gross alchemical sewage. Uh, and then there's just a bunch of derelict skeletons that the cult put there. Just, you know, it's like, hey, we have a crack in the wall. What are we going to do? Fix it? We're chaos cultists. I don't expect us to do any work like that. Um, we'll just animate some dead and leave them by the hole to guard it. That's basically what it is. Quick question uh, for you, Jim Davis. Yeah, go for it. Um, Adam wants to know, would you show this map to your players? I would not show this map, but I would show a map, especially if I was running it on a VTT. Uh, you know, I, I'd use this map with just the numbers on it. Um, I, I would keep the numbers so that it's a good frame of reference um, for communicating between you know, player and DM, but I would give them their own copy of this map uh, if it was on a VTT and then hide it with, you know, fog or whatever it is. Um, if I was playing in person, I would probably either give them a big piece of graph paper and let them just draw on it, whatever they want to draw, or I would provide them with a starter of it where the first few rooms I had drawn in so that they could know where to start on the map to have enough room for everything. Um, and then it doesn't need to look like mine as long as it's intelligible to them. And that's why I would uh, coordinate the numbers. You know, I'd, I'd let them know what number rooms was in and that kind of thing uh, so that we could at least say like, okay, we're in room 98. Even if their map doesn't look anything like mine, we know where we're at um, and they can understand it and then I can understand them uh, from what they want. So unless they were just completely uninterested in it, in which case I'd probably, I have a little hand held whiteboard that I'd use to just draw in the relevant rooms. Um, but if it was new players, I might give them just the blank map and let them see the whole thing and secret rooms and all. And, and you know, so that they have an idea of this is, you know, you're, we're exploring this place, you know, imagine that you're going through a maze Imagine you're in this place, know that you're looking at it from this perspective um, so that they have a, a good idea of you know, just what it looks like. But yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Because not every group likes to map it out themselves. I, I do because I'm a DM, <laughs> but uh, you know, not everybody does. <clears throat> so let's get back into, the, uh, into this place. Right. So in 99, that's where the real atrocity happened here. That is where the uh, graves of the honored ancestral dead were desecrated and brought forth. And then sort of throughout the rest of this, I'm going to walk through the, the back half of it. And then if we get to it, we'll get to the uh, actual cellars of the Smithsonian estate. And so here we go. So we're going toward heading towards 84. And 84, I have here uh, dwarf cult initiates. These are outcast dwarves, those dwarves that have sought refuge in the cult or have, have sought it for some uh, you know, reason of vengeance or resentment or the like. Really, for humanoid creatures, especially cultists, like they are there to combat, to oppose. They are antagonists. But they also represent a part of the setting that has gone wrong. An opportunity, if the players want to take it, to have a story of redemption or, or something, right? Like taking these dwarves alive 
trying to rescue them, seeing if they can get them out from underneath demonic influence. It's worth as much XP, if not more, than if they just fight them to the bloody death in the hallway. And so that is that is um, yet another way that I like to keep dungeons interesting and varied um, to, to allow for redemptive monsters <laughs> for, for chances that the, the heroes say no. We recognize that you think that you would have chosen something different had you been in a different if you had you had help uh, so sometimes monsters are sympathetic sometimes they're not that's what um, undead and fiends and a lot of other good stuff's for so cultists always like to have a reason for why they're cultists they're here um, basically tending to the shrines of the demon and grimball the patient as well as desecrating the ancestral heirlooms uh, through various uh, mockery graffiti you know breaking them I'd, I'd probably just riff on whatever was in my head at the time that i ran this as opposed to really detailing a list or anything uh, about what's going on but they're there making a lot of noise uh, so they would, would project the encounter or the party could come down here to 94 which represents a sort of the lounge for lack of a better word, uh, a den of decadence and indulgence for these cultists. There's going to be like a hookah <laughs> arrangement, uh, probably depending on who I'm playing with and, and the venue, various levels uh, of illicit narcotics. Magical drugs are always fun to throw in because it's something that tempts the party. Maybe they get a benefit, maybe they don't. Could be terrible, who knows? Um, but behind an illusory wall, which is what this red square is here, our access to the alchemical laboratory, library, and summoning chamber of the cannibal cult conjurer, who is currently in his library studying when the party arrives, and so could present a fight, could present a chance for the party to take a captive, or it could present a chance for the party to try to recruit someone uh, who has, well, shall we say, less than scrupulous morals uh, about who they betray and whatnot. <clears throat> So as I'm going through this, I will occasion I would occasionally to the players describe what the architecture is like, especially when running an underworld type mega dungeon, because the, the one of the pros of it, like I mentioned earlier, was that you can have an illogical arrangement of rooms. Not everything needs to make sense because you can always justify it by saying, during the last rebuilding or whatever this is the last this is the remnant that's left over from that the rest of this building was destroyed during that time and uh, so i would make use of just little things so i might describe the halls of the dwarves as being a particular style maybe they're all vaulted right they all have this sort of arched roof real wide you know tunnels lots of air lots of space as opposed to the sewer tunnels which might be cramped and moldy, things like that. It's little details like that, that if you're adding them and throwing them in regularly, you can use them as a way to convey significant information about the dungeon for players who are paying attention. It's a reward for players who are engaged. And if, you know, if your descriptions are consistent, if you're throwing in little details, then they might go like, wait a minute, okay, why? Or is, is there mold or, so, or whatever in this place? It, you know, does that mean it's damp here? Can we do something about that? What if we destroyed the ceiling? Can we flood the dungeon? That's the <laughs> that, that's what I'm hoping comes out of little details like that. Whenever I give them, is that a player will pick up on that? So <clears throat> back to the dungeon. That was a tangent. Eighty nine puts us in what I have called the trophy room which is a room of gruesome trophies and uh, unguarded treasure uh, worth 650 gold pieces. Uh, that's probably how I would describe it. I, there's a lot of talk out there about how making treasure interesting, et cetera. We have videos about it. What I found is that most players just give them the amount they'll, you know, unless it's like jewelry or something their characters can wear, uh, then most of the time I just, this is what it is. And if we really want to dig into what that 650 gold pieces looks like in practice, then we can do that at, at the time. Um, but during prep, I just put how much a treasure nugget is worth and uh, you know, we'll riff on it uh, at the time. <clears throat> and then 90 are where 
gladiator thralls employed by the uh, by the cult hangout, and I have them listed as um, that their room is filled with tawdry trinkets and curios. Uh, that these are used to pay the the, uh, the thralls. They fight in loincloths. Uh, they are paunchy, otherwise very bulky, sort of, uh, and and fight like uh, glistening, sort of uh, flabby gladiators. Uh, I, <laughs> I like the idea of. You know, the thralls are magically created beings. And so the eccentricities of their creators are expressed in their appearance. And I like to have a variety of what I would describe as Saturday morning cartoon enemies for the party to fight uh, in my Dungeons and Dragons. So that is uh, the description of those thralls. <laughs> um, so here we go. 85 is the feast hall. We're going to get into the good stuff. And then I'll answer a couple more questions. 85 is the feast hall. This is where the ancestral relics are uh, desecrated and the like. Depending on uh, the people I'm playing with and the kind of game we're going, I may tone down or tone up the, uh, the gruesomeness and brutality of this particular scene. I could have, for instance, all of the ancestral dead arrayed around the table in various scenes of mockery that the cult uh, dine with uh, as they eat their their lessers, uh, the like, uh, as as further rubbing salt in the wound, uh, or I could scale it back and just describe blood stains, ominous chains, that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, apologies to anybody who's watching somewhere. I uh, <laughs> this is the middle of the day, but um, yeah, this is where the the bad things happen, and it's where these uh, rakes who uh, are not particularly effective or high level in eighty two will end up if they're not careful. 86 sees us to the cannibal cult ghoul dens that they have dug in out of the rubble impact earth substrate. 87 is the leader of the cannibal cult's lair. I did not roll for him present, so I would put the leader of the cannibal cult on the random encounter table to represent the fact that they are just not, they're rarely found in their room. And if I wanted them in that room, I might roll a d6 and on a one or a two, they're in there. Otherwise, they're wandering the halls somewhere. Uh, having the leader's room empty lets the players who have made it this far and snuck around this far, which they might have, right? Like they could easily have gotten here without running into anything, um, learn something interesting, vital about their enemy uh, before they have to face them. So that's that's why I like leaving you know, you know, the boss's room empty, locked and trapped, of course, right? Like he's not, they're not stupid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 88 is the prison of the ancestors. This is where all of the uh, pr most precious relics and the remains of the most prestigious honored dead are kept and uh, done terrible things to their ghosts made angry and manifesting as the specter in 99. It's also where you can find more of the cannibal cult ghouls who were doing ghoulish things with their cannibalism. <clears throat> uh 91 and 92 are the jail. Basically, I've got a big ogre there that I've just called the brute. And it's a monstrous thrall, another sort of magical created humanoid. And by this point, if there's anyone that needs rescuing, if there's anyone important, an NPC that I want the party to bond with or that I want to use later, or that might be an asset to them that, you know, they've made it this far, but it doesn't look like they're going to make it out. They could use someone else that they will go in one of these cells. This is a place to put a, a help, a Benny, a resource for the party to rely on in the form of a friendly NPC who will be very grateful for getting them out of this mess. Their stuff should be in the next room over there. We just have to deal with this ogre, right? Like now you have an extra cleric that you can use. Now you got that meat shield that we needed. Oh, yep, in my pack, I've got a bunch of healing scrolls. Thank goodness, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so that is what... Um, that's what those cells are for. Uh, and, and really any jail cell in a dungeon can be there to put a, a friendly resource for the party to rely on. And I, I try not to put like doppelgangers and things in there because it just, players are already mistrustful of NPCs. Uh, so now why, why make it worse? Um, and then 93 is the torture chamber. It's way far away from the others, I guess, so that they can get the peace and quiet they need. Um, but it's the torture chamber. They do torture things in there. <clears throat> That's about mostly it. Like for the dungeon, I would see it as you know a chance that the party can sneak in, learn something about this place. I keep the all the areas in tan 
uh, as level three, whereas the surrounding areas of the dungeon are level one. And so everything in here is just a bit tougher, just a bit more, you know, hits a bit harder. There is an overgrown uh, dwarf, like a dwarf that's become the size of an ogre called the Great Eater in uh, room 110. And that is a nasty encounter that the party wouldn't you know, necessarily want to have to face without knowing about it. They'd get a lot of treasure for it. They're creating zombies and other things in rooms 103 and 105. Party could loot those for supplies or, or destroy them, disrupt the cult's um, you know, operations there. There's temples to the various demons and the like. They could learn the names of those demons to further combat them or summon them themselves. They could desecrate them to piss off the cult or to disrupt their uh, mystical and supernatural resources that they can call upon. All of these things are possible. And by for me, by knowing who's in what room as they first experience it, coupled with the encounter table, I will have everything that I need to run this place as a very dynamic environment that the players explore room to room, proceeding cautiously or recklessly as they see fit and discovering you know, what, what's there. You know, maybe they find some ropes and pretend to be members of the cult. Um, moving through it, you get to a series of, of, of secret rooms within the cult. And eventually these are sort of the facade that the Smithsonian estate uh, Scion has put up to, you know, if anybody comes poking their nose around, it looks like there's a shrine to the ancestral dead that's well kept. <coughs> we know it's not. It looks like the family heirlooms are well kept, but they're facsimiles, they're not real. And there's a, you know, trapped <laughs> treasure chest over here that dumps you into the den of the great eater. You know, but also this is the cellar of a, an estate, an urban townhouse. So there's servants, domestic staff, things like that that are there who can tell you there's something not right here. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, the up, you know, the above ground uh, level, which would just be a generic townhouse. That's the uh, Orange Stars. There. Um, so yeah, I, that's essentially how I prep both a big dungeon or or small, right? Like if it was four or five rooms or you know 153, <laughs> I I use a you know that random method. And then just iterate and find the patterns and connections until something interesting emerges and then leave the rest for play. I, I don't want to do too much to it before uh, we actually sit down to play it because the more I develop it, the more I work on it, the more set it becomes. And I want something that is malleable, that, that still has a lot of potential to it. And so I want just enough to, you know, trigger my my imagination to, to go off on a tangent at the table when we're all vibing, we're all having a good time together. And I, I know, okay, now is the moment when we need to slow it down. You know, the, this, this, is, this encounter could go many ways, but I'm going to choose, I'm choosing as a DM to have it go this way because it fits the pace of, of where we're at. Uh, or we need to pick things up. This could be another slow encounter right here could do another talking, but what if this person down here that they're about to run into is just tired of the underworld and about to snap uh, and, and will, you know, conflict will emerge from that. Um, so yeah, that's, that is essentially the process where I would go from here. is creating a roster of all the monsters for each of the color areas of the dungeon so that I can know at a glance again, where and, and, and who everyone has. Uh, available as, as you know, party to fight, and then I would use those rosters to create the random uh, encounter tables, adding in other things that didn't make it onto this list from the master tables uh, that we'll link to, um, just to kind of keep it a dynamic and vibrant place. But um, let's answer a couple more questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got some questions. Not. Um, asking them to you in order because we're not going to be able to get through. Yeah, all yeah, I won't them. be able to get to all of them. That's yeah. How Oliver it goes. K. Oliver K. Yeah. How would you go about theming a dungeon? Do you start with the inhabitants or the layout and description of the dungeon? Dungeon themes. Dungeon themes. So just as a quick thing, I I I love drawing dungeon maps. I hate every one I draw. Um, so I usually use someone else's on those. And what I do is, is looking at someone else's dungeon uh, means that I'm, I've got to interpret their idea, 
of what this place should be, which already means my brain's working on what it could be, what it might be. Usually another element I'll bring in for theming is just what am I into at the moment? What is interesting to me? Doesn't matter what it is, right? If, you know, my son's watching a bunch of ocean documentaries because he's into ocean creatures, then that's what my D&D is going to be about too. Uh, so whatever it is in my life that's going on, either personally or, or externally or whatever I'm interested in, something about that is gameable, <laughs> right? Or, or will provide the, the nugget uh, that I can then build something uh, for the dungeon round. So for this one, it's the idea of decay, of, of systematic and, um, and, and, you know, civilizational uh, decay. You know, the area of the dungeon that has the scribes is buried as well, right? This is an imperial archive where presumably important information is kept. And it's, it's as leveled and, and ruined as the rest of the place. The pauper's grave that had imperial patrons is turned into a criminal's you know, carnal pit. Uh, so I go for the theme of this place used to have a function which supported the city and has now become a dangerous, monstrous environment because of the decay. Uh, the goblins are more like a criminal gang than civil servants despite what they say, right? So uh, that is, that's one thing that, that covers the whole of the dungeon, but then individual areas might have their own theme. Uh, so everything in purple on that map is the layer of the priests of a God of the underworld. Someone that, that, you know, is caretaker of the dead and, uh, you know, for, foresees the future, sort of a mysterious Oracle God. And this is the sort of minor shrine that their pilgrims take as they venture further and further into the depths of the earth, get, trying to get closer to their God. And that has its own different theme within the theme of decay and, and, and crumbling, right, of ruin. So it's not well-staffed. There's only one priest there. You've got to befriend them to gain their services. It's not it doesn't just work. Um, but it is different in that it's a, if you can befriend them, it's a place to gather information, place to rest, uh, to get resources and the like. So yeah, I, I draw from a lot of different things and then I, I do my best to, to make them gameable, to, to bolt them onto some D&Dism that I can use. Uh, and yeah. Good question. All right. Yeah. Um, kind of building on this, uh, Adam Goss, when you, when you're building a dungeon of this size, how do you determine the purpose and layout of each room? How do you maintain a level of verisimilitude mm -hmm. if you do that at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's part of the reason why I, I, I like a mega dungeon that's under a city that has a lot of layers to it is you can partition off areas. So everything that's in tan, all of the straight lines there, I would describe as one way. Right, that, this has a very consistent feel. These are the vaults of a dwarven estate. They used to serve a function. I will consider the layout. I have a big list of room names. <laughs> Part of the dungeon alphabet is what they have is R is for room. And it's a D hundred table of just rooms, amphitheater, bedroom, privy, whatever, you know, just rooms. Um, so the, the secret tool of, of DMs is a thesaurus. Like you just need words to, uh, in a lot of cases to help uh, provide that because if you can give every one of these rooms a specific name, this is the makeshift cavern. This is the old cistern. This is the manky din, right? Things like that, descriptive name function. Then you can use that as a wave to convey that information to the players. Oh yeah, room... Uh, 119, the great eater's toilet <laughs> is what it's called. And so, yeah, that's, that is, uh, that is how I, I basically think of my dungeon, but I also don't um, feel like I've got to be absolutely bound by that rule. Part of the fun of a dungeon is that you are in a supernatural environment. It, parts of it that don't make sense if they're juxtaposed with parts that do make sense it heightens the parts that don't make sense right so this is why if you have a dungeon that seems normal but you change the layout between <laughs> when the the party goes into it between sessions 
then you know, with no explanation for them, they have to figure that out, right? Um, while you, <laughs> hopefully, before you, <laughs> you, you know, after you've figured it out yourself, and then you can sort of play around with that it's a supernatural environment as well. It's a mythic underworld, um, so I don't, I don't feel too bound to, to make it make sense. I don't, I don't feel like I got to account for every basic need that it, the dungeons denizens have. If there's some water somewhere, if there's a place that they could put some food or grow some weird mushrooms, um, then that's usually enough for me. Um, and again, one of the reasons I set it underneath the city is that a lot of those concerns go away because I can say it's just a different part of the ruined underworld here. And if they need something, they send somebody up top to get it. Uh, they don't grow food down here or do anything crazy like that. They you know, hide dead bodies and treasure and plan their secret plots and things like that. But that sort of thing. They, this is where the adventure happens, not where logistics occurs. Right on. Um, another question um, from Adam ask, asking you to speak to what do you do when the players leave? And then they come back, like, do you repopulate? And there's also another question here from um, somebody else, which is like, do you make quick exits? Do you, how do you, do you Getting make it any easier for people to leave a dungeon of this, of this size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll first one, second one first, first and second. <clears throat> I'll see if I remember the, the first one. Oh, let me get to it. <laughs> uh, it all depends on the kind of game I'm running. If we have time, the, they have to leave as as fast as they came in now or the way they came in now the, the thing is if i'm running classic dd any of the retro clones the movement rates are like just bafflingly slow something like two feet around is what the movement rates turn out to be it's, it's like nuts but it also assumes that the party is proceeding through dimly lit cobblestone co uh, corridors, mapping, checking for traps, going slowly, trying to be quiet. They are inching forward, exploring this place. So when they leave, they don't need to take that kind of caution. They can book it. They know the way here. That's why they made a map. That's why I gave the one. That's why they left a trail of chalk marks, string, whatever, you know, and uh, so they can move a lot faster. And I will either handle it as just, okay, it's going to be two, two or three wandering monster checks. And that, that mean, that may mean nothing. It may mean that there's the way is completely clear. Um, if there is something there, again, if, depending on the time of the session, we'll either play it out completely uh, or, or <laughs> what we used to do when, uh, when I was younger and we were, you know, play and it would get too late is speed clear, which is just the players start rolling dice, writing down their numbers and I just start calling out monsters and they start calling out numbers and it's just, it, it becomes quite chaotic and uh, rushed, but everything kind of happens at once. And, you know, you sort of sort it out <laughs> at the time. It's been a long time since I've, I've done a speed clear like that. Um, but it, it, I remember them being uh, interesting and fun uh, at least. The other thing to do is they roll on a get out the dungeon table. If time is of the essence, if we have to end on a certain time, whatever, and the party doesn't make it, the party doesn't make time for their exit, then there's like a, okay, make a save. If you make the save, you're out. If you fail, it's time to roll on this. You, you were stuck in the dungeon. Something happened on the way out. And it would be a narrative prompt with an effect. So it's like you got captured or you got lost you know, stumbling in the dark or bumped your head, got knocked out, you know, something happened to your character on the way out. And while they are out, they are not uh, unscarred from the experience. And it could be, you know, like start next session with no hit dice, start with a level of exhaustion, take a lingering injury uh, to change a bond or a, you know, like give yourself a new flaw or something. So it could be, it could have a variable degree of impact based on the kind of game that I'm running. Um, second question, or the first question was, what to do when the players leave about the dungeon, yes? <clears throat> yeah. Asking, yeah. Yep. So um, basically, uh, it, the same method that I used to stock the dungeon initially, I would go through after a session or two, right? Uh, I want the players to see the impact their actions have had. If they've cleared out a bunch of rooms, I want those rooms to stay empty for a while. But after a few sessions, 
I will go back through and roll on the initial table, which was uh, from a few live streams ago of on a D6, you know, for each room. On a one through a two, there's a monster. If it's a one, there's also treasure. Then three is a trap or something. And just sort of go through that uh, six is empty. Um, sometimes I use 2D6 if there's a if there's a lot of room. Like this one, I ended up using 2D6 for to um, use a bell curve instead of the flat D6 distribution. But I just go back through it. And you don't even have to use dice. You can just go like, hey, I know that there's other people in the dungeon here who would move into these rooms. So like, like there's now goblins in this room because the goblins in room 20, they've been wanting to expand. These rooms are empty. You know, they don't care how, uh, you know, the, how the lizard folk were cleared out. They're going to move in. And so you can do it uh, from a narrative sense, what makes sense to you, how you understand your dungeon. Um, other things are new construction, uh, an infestation of some kind, magical calamity that's occurred. Other adventurer parties have come in and done and changed it. They've broken doors. They've knocked down walls. They've riled up particular denizens of the dungeon. They're lost, you know, and are part of the wandering encounter tables. All that kind of stuff uh, are ways that you can add things into the dungeon. And um, occasionally something new just appears because it's a magical wonderland of terror. <laughs> and sometimes things just happen. Sometimes it's silly. You know, uh, sometimes it's terrifying. Um, yeah. All right. I think it's time for us to wrap up. It is. It is. I think that was it. I love the questions, guys. Um, can't get to them all, but I appreciate them. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little peek into the uh, mega dungeon uh, of the Imperial Undercity and a bit of my process for how I create these kinds of environments. Not sure what we're going to do on our next live stream, uh, but next week's video uh, we have for you is a real treat. Uh, I'm excited for you guys to, uh, to see it. Uh, so we will be back with a live stream in two weeks. Uh, we're going to be alternating uh, regular shows, sort of pre-recorded shows with live streams uh, for at least through the end of the month. Uh, we'll see. We'll keep you guys up.